Hello, welcome to News Click. We're discussing today the life and politics of Shimon Peres, who died in Israel a few days back. And uh, he's uh, a man who's being celebrated in the international news media as a person who stood for peace in uh, the troubled land. We have with us uh, Marin Mantovani, uh, international activist who's worked extensively for the cause of Palestine. She was involved with the boycott, disinvestment and sanctions movement against Israel. She was involved with the original drafting of the charter of this movement back in 2005. So Marin, nice to have you here. And uh, uh, the international news media has been saturated with coverage of uh, Shimon Peres and uh, most of it has been extremely, uh, in terms of his legacy, extremely positive. How would you truly assess his uh, his uh, legacy in terms of uh, contribution to Israel and the, and the longer term prospects for peace in Palestine? Well, I guess uh, talking about Sh Shimon Peres, it's interesting to look at uh, two aspects. A, the reality of what his legacy is, and B, the meaning of peace within the framework of an official discourse on Palestine. Evidently, for everybody that knows a bit of history, and especially for the Palestinian people, it is evident that uh, Shimon Peres' legacy is a legacy of war, of war crimes, from the very beginning uh, of the establishment of the State of Israel, where he was involved in the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. Mm. Uh, that has led to the destruction of over 500 uh, Palestinian villages and the expulsion of 75% uh, of the Palestinian population from the lands that then became Israel, to uh, the building up of the Israeli military industry, the building up of the nuclear program of Israel, the selling then of that nuclear program uh, to, at that time, apartheid South Africa, various massacres. The most famous one is uh, the Kana ma massacre, the massacre uh, they did, uh, the Israeli military did in Lebanon against a UN compound. Uh, uh, and that then officially as well has been recognized as having been an uh, intentional attack on a UN compound. Uh, so we could continue stories about his uh, legacy and his involvement uh, in Israeli war crimes. But I think more interesting is how it comes that such a person has become a symbol of peace. And I think it's very interesting. And it was Perez himself that has worked hard to transform him, himself into a symbol of peace. And he, it was him to build the Paris Peace Center that then globally has been working over the last uh, uh, decades to promote an Israeli vision of peace. And Paris has uh, then worked to promote the vision of peace where Israel continues uh, to colonize Palestinian land, ethnically cleanse Palestinian land, continues to attack the Palestinian and the Arab people around the world. Uh, uh, around the, uh, the area uh, in Palestine and in Lebanon, in Syria, in other places. And at the same time, uh, uh, develops a vision of saying, this is peace as long as the Palestinians don't resist. So the, he was one of the members of the Haganah, the first Jewish militia, which uh, fought to, to create the state of Israel, and uh, partly through <coughs> attacks on the occupying power, which was Britain at that time, and also through evacuation of Palestinian villages by force. Uh, is there anything specific known about his, uh, his life and times in the Haganah? I mean, one interesting thing about Shimon Peres is that already at that time, uh, he was uh, directly involved in the entire military uh, and weapons transfers uh, to the Haganah. I mean, it's very interesting that since that very moment, uh, he has been the one to actually build up the military uh, capacities of Israel that then have been fundamental since uh, that time to uh, uh, engage in, uh, in war crimes. Uh, so that this person then becomes a person of peace is quite uh, symbolic. He was director general of the defense ministry and then later the deputy defense minister. I think during the 1967 war he was the deputy defense minister when 
Yitzhak Rabin was uh, chief of staff of the Israeli army. And the two became the prominent faces of the Israeli Labour Party, uh, which came to be portrayed as the party of peace uh, in the 1990s. Now, how is that, uh, that plan? Uh, uh, because I remember uh, there was a lot of pressure on the US to bring that peace process into existence because of the whole uh, alliance they built with the Gulf states to expel Iraq from Kuwait in 1991. And uh, then uh, there was a briefly lived initiative which was public, starting with the Madrid Peace Conference, which broke up in acrimony and uh, uh, lack of agreement. Uh, and then it went kind of underground and was conducted in secret and then was announced in 1993 as the Oslo framework. It was evidently for Israel a very important uh, uh, point in rebuilding a uh, broken economy uh, at the beginning of the 90s. Because what it really brought is for Palestinians, uh, de facto, more colonization, more settlements. And we forgot to mention before that uh, uh, Shimon Peres was as well one of the founding fathers of the entire settlement project. That is another thing, I mean, uh, where we should uh, remember him for. Um, and at the same time, for Israel, what it brought on an economic level was normalization. It was the moment when India, for world example, right. normalized uh, with Israel. Uh, parts of the Arab world normalized relations with Israel. Many Muslim countries normalized their relations with Israel. And that, China as well, and that has built the basis for Israel to continue to expand markets and to diversify markets as well, to come to a point where today uh, Israeli economy is not as dependent on US and European markets anymore that they, than they were before, but on the contrary, always more interested and more uh, dependent on uh, Asian markets, China and India, the, the two biggest uh, partners in the, in the region, Latin America. And uh, this really has made that for uh, Israel, the Oslo Accords were really an economic uh, uh, positive adventure. For the Palestinian people, it has really not brought much. The only thing it did bring is that Israel and the Oslo process uh, imported a few Palestinian capitalists that during the Oslo pro process, working together with Israel and international capital, have built up uh, quite some uh, money and influence. But that really has only a negative impact on the cohesion of the Palestinian society and the Palestinian struggle as such. The Gaza Jericho, was, was that the moment when, uh, when the world should have called, uh, called the bluff? I mean, uh, to put it uh, differently. Uh, because till then they had got some mileage in terms of uh, pursuit of peace. Uh, but Gaza Jericho kind of made it uh, evident. Definitely. I mean, that was a, a, a key moment and one of the moments where one should have said uh, this uh, is a process that uh, is not bringing peace, that is not bringing justice, that is just uh, building uh, the basis of what today is the Bantustanisa Bantustanization, the ghettos that Israel is building now for the Palestinian people. Um, I guess at that point, it was really as well that the Palestinian National Authority wasn't ready yet uh, to call it a bluff and to say, uh, we're not, we're going back to where we were. Uh, before uh, 91. So Perez's last act as prime minister, he took over the Labour Party leadership after Rabin's assassination and uh, led the party in the 96 uh, uh, general elections. Prior to that, he launched the assault on Lebanon, which, of course, as you mentioned, included that infamous massacre in a UN refugee compound in Kana, the Kana massacre, in which 100 people were reportedly killed. So uh, that was his last real, uh, real act of destruction as a Palestinian prime minister. What has been his contribution since then? Because after that, even more destructive elements like Ehud Barak and uh, Ariel Sharon uh, became uh, leaders. And of course, Benjamin Netanyahu immediately succeeded uh, Perez as prime minister. And then you had Barak, Sharon, Olmert, 
uh, now back to uh, Netanyahu. I mean, I guess he was really, uh, especially when you have people like uh, Netanyahu, uh, Lieberman, and Sharon at the forefront of uh, the Israeli government. Having somebody like uh, Perez, uh, even uh, uh, until his last days as a president, he was an exceptionally important uh, player for Israel to whitewash wash its crimes, to sell the Israeli will for peace while all the others were continuing the massacres. So in this sense, in order for this brand Israel ideological whitewash, he was a crucial person in building up uh, that one and the whole idea of uh, economic peace, i.e. how can neoliberal policies destroy uh, where Israeli weapons don't reach. Right. Thank you so much, Marin Mantovani. Uh, that's yeah. been a very interesting discussion and uh, uh, best wishes for your continuing struggle for justice for Palestine.